an organization called Cyber Law Initiative that is viewing technology through a legal lens. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ethan from the UK. Um, I'm a Google, Google Europe Scholar. I'm on the Google Mentoring Program and I'm on the Google Vulner App Security <laughs> Vulnerability Research Program. So thank you for literally all of my income. <laughs> uh, and outside of that, I'm a bachelor student in computer science in London. Hi, I'm Moto Ikenzi Vigilis. I'm from AIT. I'm a student and working in ESOP Chapter 8. Nice to be there. Hi, I'm Enoch from Nigeria. Uh, I've been very angry with Google for a long time because I've been trying to apply to be, a, to be part of the Google Ambassadors, but my best friend got it, so no worries. Uh, three, the, three years ago, I participated uh, in the Google Online Marketing Challenge. We were second in Africa. Uh, two years ago, we were third in Africa, unfortunately. Um, I'm a huge fan of Google Cloud. I love it. Uh, glad to be here. Hello, um, I'm Paul from Cambodia and I work as a system memory center at a private company in Phnom Penh. So, uh, and my first time went to Google was in 2011. So, so thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Sherry from Hong Kong. Um, I'm a literature student. I work with ISOC Hong Kong. Uh, we actually have a project called Open Data Index Hong Kong and we are thinking to approach Google to make it sustainable, and I'm also planning to apply for my MPhil study, having the research interest in cyber sovereignty, given that there's a hit discussion on the different approaches to shape internet. Hello, my name is Josefina. I'm from Argentina. I allow students. Okay. Thank you. Great. Hello, I'm Beata Roginskita. I'm coming from Lithuania. And at the moment, I'm studying in the Netherlands my master's degree, uh, Crisis and Security Management, um, Specialization Terrorism. I'm Raphael. Um, I'm a data science fellow for a charity in London. Okay. Hello, I'm Rocio from Argentina. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in communications and a diploma in internal governance, and currently working at LACTLD, that is the organization that brings together CCTLDs in Latin America and the Caribbean. Hi, uh, my name is Samrit. I'm from New Delhi, India. Um, I just graduated from a uh, university where I studied computer science and political science. Um, so my interest is in digital policy and the ethical implications of AI. Uh, I'm currently working on setting. I'm currently working on setting up a new technical university in India. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Kushagra Bhargav from India. I've been currently working on several aspects of privacy on online social networks. Uh, been uh, interesting uh, work uh, using applied machine learning, and I'm currently moving to uh, Los Angeles for my master's uh, in computer science. Where? University of Southern California. Hi, I am Ana Carolina from Brazil, and I study economic, economic and regulatory law. And I'm also a co-organizer of a um, movement called Legal Hackers. Uh, this movement uh, discusses uh, the intersection law and technology. Hi, everyone. Hi, Google. My name is Lily from Ghana. And I work with the Ghana Community Network Services Limited. And I'm also head of community engagement for Hack Lab Ghana. And I'm also part of the Python Software Foundation and the community in Ghana. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Samara Semensa. I'm a media practitioner in Brockler from um, Ghana. I want to thank Google for uh, AdSense. It's really helping people in Ghana. But um, the only problem is the approval process is very, very difficult for us. So I want to know how you can make the internet useful for more people, especially in Ghana, considering the number of people that are getting online digitally, especially the youth. So thank you. Hello, um, I'm Rashida, also from Ghana, and I'm a final year marketing student. And um, I work with an organization that uses um, artificial intelligence to actually answer questions about female reproductive health. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Jauri Carr. I'm from Costa Rica. I'm, I work as a public policy analyst in a Central American organization that um, works with the use and regulation of information technolo and technology communications and also the defense of human rights in the digital environment. And we make uh, initiatives, projects um, to introduce the civil society into these discussions in also the Central American region that's usually not really um, involved in, in topics regarding internet governance and technologies. Hi, I'm Nardina Nimmer. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Canberra, researching algorithms and online deliberation. So just the very idea, if we say, it leads to more polarization, at less, in fact, reduces polarization. I'm just trying to deconstruct this myth. Um, and I've also worked with civil society groups on digital rights in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, hello, I'm Marco. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm Marco from Macedonia. I'm last year in the studies of computer science and the Bachelor of Computer Science, also working as a system administrator and a coordinator of youth IGF in my country. Hello, I am Carla. I'm from Mexico. Uh, I work in Rhizomatica and uh, I studied international relations. I work with indigenous people, but in the advocacy part. So I am at CITEL meetings and ITU meetings doing advocacy. And that's it. Ah, on community networks, so. I have a really loud voice, so I'll just project. <laughs>
once right away. You might find that just looking at the number, you might find that I'm going to send you to someone else. It might take me a while, honestly, but I will respond to every email, okay? Even if it takes like it might take two months, I'm honest. I'm serious. <laughs> Um, okay, hi. Uh, so, um, when it comes to implementing the multi stakeholder approach, um, what are some of the challenges uh, that Google has faced when it comes to collaborating with uh, developing countries like India? And um, what what is what are some of the things or what is the manner or capacity in which people our age can contribute to that? Thanks. Yeah. So um, uh, my question is regarding uh, access to public data using uh, Google APIs. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the uh, number of Google APIs that uh, the APIs that Google has provided. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, right from uh, YouTube Data API, Google Geo uh, Coding API, this is really uh, good for academic research. But uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you really think? Uh, Apart from academic research, now uh, different governments have started using this, uh, this, these APIs for actionable insights. Uh, as a matter of fact, we know that uh, the Indian government or US government or uh, even the Chinese government uh, uh, use these APIs. But my question uh, is, is it fair uh, for uh, uh, the academy, uh, academic community uh, when different companies like Google or Facebook are now restricting ac more access to public data? Uh, in the name of uh, privacy or personal privacy, because then uh, academic research is also going forward. If we restrict them from the data, it won't be uh, useful, or it won't be they won't be able to progress more in terms of uh, human behavior, detecting human behavior. <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. laughs>
is designed to, you know, capacity build and get more of you involved and engaged. So with that, I've got to go to my meeting, but yeah, thank I you very much for sharing. <laughs>
Hello, hello everyone. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jorge Cancio. I work for the Swiss Federal Office of uh, Communications. And I've been asked to moderate uh, this session. So uh, thank you very much to the session organizers, first of all, for this honor. And uh, I We'll try to give you a short introduction of this 90-minute session. So um, we are going to discuss uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and the future of diplomacy, what's in store. And uh, well, later on, Katarina will give you some uh, more details on how the session is uh, structured. But uh, first of all, as uh, somebody who more or less uh, uh, is engaged in uh, diplomacy, although from a non-diplomatic uh, uh, ministry, I wanted to share with you some, some personal impressions about artificial intelligence. And this uh, leads uh, later on to, to how the session is uh, structured. 
Uh, AI as a topic uh, is, of course, something uh, which is on the agenda of uh, all of us who are dealing with uh, international topics related to digital policy. And we are seeing that AI uh, comes up in many different fora, be it in the ITU, be it here in the IGF, be it in the OECD, in many other places, Council of Europe. So that's, there's a plethora of places where AI is really popping up as a very important topic, even as uh, in, in relation with uh, uh, the lethal autonomous weapons. So it goes from uh, what's the impact of AI on freedom of expression, on uh, democratic rights, as we are discussing in the Council of Europe, to these uh, much, uh, not much more serious, but much more, let's say, critical topics of uh, to, to what extent uh, autonomous weapons can be, uh, can be something that can be admitted by the international community. And we heard uh, the UN Secretary General only 10 days ago or one week ago in Lisbon calling for uh, the prohibition of, uh, of lethal autonomous weapons. Then we have, of course, artificial intelligence and uh, the geopolitical implications of it. We are seeing a run of uh, national, regional strategies to position different uh, uh, regions, different uh, economic or military uh, alliances in, in, this, uh, in this remit because uh, as uh, will be mentioned uh, later on, uh, artificial intelligence is being seen as one key technology which in the future may uh, change the power structure of our international relations. And lastly, but not, uh, but not uh, less importantly, of course artificial intelligence is also an instrument for uh, the practitioners, those who are working in, in diplomatic environments. Uh, at least in my case, we don't use it so much, uh, uh, but uh, I'm aware of colleagues in other parts of the Swiss administration who, for instance, use uh, algorithmic uh, tools uh, and big data to monitor what's uh, the perception of Switzerland and in other countries which are uh, important to which are important to us so uh, I guess that with this and also with uh, perhaps with the plea to 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 all of us to try to distinguish when we are talking about artificial intelligence as a specific artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence related to specific functions. And when we are talking about a more future uh, general artificial intelligence, which uh, at least in, as far as I know, is uh, still some decades away, uh, I would like to uh, introduce also the, if the music allows, <laughs> okay, uh, after this commercial uh, break, <laughs> we, we have, for, for these three uh, streams of, of work, we have uh, three excellent uh, leads. Uh, first of all, we have Mike Nelson here to my left from Cloudflare, but who also teaches in Georgetown University, who will be leading on AI as a topic on the international agenda, so I'm very interested in learning from you. Uh, then afterwards, we have also Claudio Lucena to the right of me, uh, who is a professor at the Paraiba State University in Brazil, and of course has many other heads on, and he will be leading uh, our work on artificial intelligence and the global geopolitical environment. And uh, lastly, Katarina Hönne, 
from Diplo Foundation uh, will uh, introduce us to artificial intelligence as a tool for diplomacy. So I think that perhaps, Katarina, you want to give some more details on how we structure this uh, interactive session and uh, then we continue. Okay, so thank you, uh, first of all, for coming. And I see and I heard that there are actually quite a number of people who tried to get into this session but couldn't. So uh, consider yourself privileged for being here. Um, this session is going to be a little different. We're going to try to be as interactive as possible. And after I finished explaining the format to you, you will hear from the three of us a very brief um, pitch on these three topics. And after that, we're going to split up in three groups corresponding to the three topics. And each group, guided by us, but mainly led by you, is going to dig deeper into this topic to kind of see what is your knowledge about this, what is your position on these questions. So we're going to have about 30 minutes for this interactive part. And the way we're going to do this is there's going to be one group in the back. And we're going to turn the chairs around so you can sit on both sides of um, the tables. One group over here and a third group who is going to try to find some space outside to discuss. After all of this commotion and after 30 minutes of discussion, we come back here. And then again, it's over to you because each group needs uh, one or two rapporteurs who summarize what has been discussed in the groups. We will hear from them and then we will go into um, further questions and answers. But basically, be prepared for uh, quite some interactive discussion and for uh, quite some movement during this session. Okay, thank you so much, Katarina. So I think that uh, we start with the uh, pitches and I have uh, as first in my line, uh, but uh, do you want to go first? Or yes, I had, it makes sense. It makes sense. So we look at the geopolitical environment right. first with Claudio. Thank you very much, Jorge. Thank you very much, you all, for coming. Uh, uh, my, my current connection with AI as, as research project is coming from Portugal. We are trying to devise a framework to analyze and assess the, the adoption of law enforcement measures that embed some kind of automation. So that's the connection we're here approaching it from a slightly different perspective, which is the future of diplomacy. I think it was very interesting that Jorge mention, mentioned uh, in the beginning the idea that we didn't make that disclaimer in the session. It's, that's why I know this as an interesting point. We're not here interested in general, in, in, in general AI. We're looking at instruments or tools or mechanisms or techniques. To, to be more specific, I, I would be saying that we're looking at analytics over big data and how this can happen or influence or impact the international geopolitical environment. Uh, for our group, I'm proposing we work with three different categories of what I say are uh, initiatives, AI-related initiatives. And we're going to take a look at some, or discuss some institutional, non-governmental ones, as we have the declarations. You might have heard about the Montreal Declaration from uh, headed or by the University of, of Montreal with a more ethics approach. You might have heard also about the Toronto Declaration that was released earlier this year. These are instruments that we're going to discuss. You might have also uh, heard about the Ethically Aligned Design, which is an initiative from the IEEE Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineering, all of which touch these initiatives do not necessarily plan to regulate or intervene in a more, in a more hard law way in, in artificial intelligence, but they do touch it from some perspective. The other category I, I would propose us to take a look is the uh, governmental initiatives. And in this sense, we have a number of strategies, as it was mentioned. The, the, the strategies are there. Many of them are already being drafted. Some are, are, are already finished. This is a movement from the past, I, I'd say, from the past two years in a more systematic way. Uh, and the third category of interventions we would be looking at would be the international ones. We have. Uh, 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 a joint initiative in, in AI for Good coming from the ITU and the, the, in connection with other agencies, uh, World uh, Health Organization also from, a, from a earlier development this, this year. And in, in, in a perspective of legislation, purely speaking, we have the report from earlier last year. It's, I, I don't know if it, had, it has been that long, but a proposal from the Euro European Parliament that touches some aspects of artificial intelligence, getting to the point of promoting in a very controversial Article 59 
D, legal personality for robots. So these are the categories that we're going to focus at. And we're, we're going to focus much less on what they aim at, but what they, what they represent for the development of the geopolitical scenario in the international arena. That's pretty much our focus. Perfect, uh, Claudia. Thank you so much. Now it's the turn for your pitch. Uh, let's see how many you convinced to take part in your group, Mike. It looks like we've got some very good people around the table, so I hope at least a third of them will come and join this, this discussion. Um, I'm Mike Nelson. I've been working on Internet policy for more than 30 years, starting when I worked with Senator Gore back in 1988. And since then, uh, for at least 15 of those years, I've had a list of the most emotional buttons that get people excited about Internet policy. And they all begin with the letter P. Privacy, piracy, protectionism, uh, policing, psychology, procurement, payments. It turns out that when you take this list I've got, almost all of them are also hot buttons when we talk about artificial intelligence. And that's the last time I'm going to use the phrase artificial intelligence. That's a term that's been around since 1958 and has at least 37 different definitions. So like you, I'm going to focus on the question of big data and how machine learning allows us to pull out insights. I'm not going to talk about the robots. I'm not going to talk about vision systems or uh, sp speech algorithms. I'm going to talk about how do you take a lot of data and do something creative with it. That power, the power of machine learning to give companies and individuals superhuman capabilities is why everyone's freaking out. That's why there are at least five sessions at this meeting talking about AI when they really mean machine learning. This meeting's really important because it's going to inform a lot of discussions that go back to national capitals and to other organizations. Let me give you my list of nine ways in which national governments are trying to understand how machine learning will impact what they do. Obviously, the one that's gotten a lot of attention here is about content. How will we use machine learning to differentiate between legal content and illegal content? But there's another one, another big issue. We haven't, I haven't heard it mentioned yet, and that is competition and antitrust. There's a lot of concern that the biggest companies who have the biggest amounts of data are going to have data dominance. They're going to have the best, most powerful machine learning algorithms because they have the data. And this isn't just Amazon and Microsoft and IBM. This is Baidu and some of the Chinese companies as well. Third issue, obviously, privacy. Is machine learning going to allow companies and countries to learn so much about us that we'll have a sense that we have no privacy. They'll, even if we haven't shared information about our personal habits, they'll be able to infer from data that they gather elsewhere, things that we don't want to share. Fourth, cybersecurity. This is where Cloudflare comes in. We provide um, protection to, uh, to 12 million websites. That means we have data on what two and a half billion internet users are doing every month. And as a result, we can use machine learning to find out where the bad guys are. A more recent issue is elections and the use of social media to alter um, uh, th those issues, <coughs> to al uh, alter election results let me finish with the last three, uh, four. Uh, obviously, machine learning and job creation. Number seven, machine learning and defense. Again, there's a concern that somehow the foreigners are going to take over the technology and going to uh, use it for military advantage. Number eight, uh, you mentioned it already, policing and the use of uh, machine learning in detecting crime on and offline. And then the last is uh, another relatively new one, but what are we doing to our kids with smart toys that interact with them as if they were
human or superhuman. So anyway, those are nine issues that I hope come up. I imagine several of you will bring a 10th and 11th and 12th issue to the discussion about what national governments are doing. Thank you, and sorry to take so long. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. And uh, now we have Katarina. Uh, thank you. After these two uh, pitches, I guess the, the pressure is um, on. So I'm going to focus on AI as a tool for diplomats and policy makers. And I'm going to do my introduction in three threes. So let me start with like three preliminary observations or um, three questions. So my first question is, are we starting from the right kind of question when we look at AI applications as a tool for diplomacy and policy making? Are we looking at what is technically possible or are we looking at the tasks and problems we're facing in these areas? Second, uh, I want to talk about ubiquitousness in the sense that are we looking at applications that are smoothly integrated into the work of diplomats and policymakers, or are we looking at things that will stick out uh, like, like a sore thumb? Um, third, um, human centeredness. Are we applying a human centered approach? And in this sense, are we looking at AI, artificial intelligence, or are we, are we really looking at um, intelligence? Or, intelligence augmentation, so services that augment human intelligence rather than a totally new form of intelligence. Let me talk about the three areas of AI or AI tools for diplomacy and policy making that I have in mind. Usually as Diplo Foundation we're talking here about diplomatic functions and how various new technologies can support these diplomatic functions, but here I have broken it down even further. So what I'm going to talk about is basically speaking, writing and researching. And as you can guess, we're basically in the area of natural language processing in its various forms. So again, machine learning, but here focused on the ability of machines to understand language and interact with human beings. So speaking, we're looking at questions of the use of chat bur uh, chatbots when it comes to the first contact uh, with citizens or uh, in consular affairs. We're also looking at automated message messages in terms of public diplomacy or public interaction. Writing. We've seen uh, a great example just this year, which is um, Project Debata from IBM, which was able to reason a debate with human beings. So abstracting from that, are we seeing the possibility of AI supporting the writing of speeches? To how far can this be taken and how far are we comfortable with this kind of application of AI? Lastly, researching, and here we're talking about AI, especially in support of preparation for negotiation, for uh, policy talks and interaction. And we've seen a couple of examples already in this. One very recent example is the so-called um, cognitive trait advisor, which is an AI that works with natural language processing that looks at um, legal documents and is able to basically give the researcher a very quick overview of specific topics that come up in these documents, thus cutting down the time that is available for research. Let me also tell you the three questions that I think we can focus on. What are the opportunities and limits, given current developments? What constitutes meaningful human control? And I think here it kind of echoes the debate about lethal autonomous weapons, but I think a similar question comes up. How happy are we to relinquish intelligence to, to a second entity? How happy are we to outsource some of these very human tasks, speaking, writing, researching, to something that is well, not human? Uh, and lastly, what kind of dangers and pitfalls do we see as these technologies perhaps become more prominent? Okay, perfect, Katarina. So you have heard the three pitches. Now I think that we break up into the three groups. So uh, if you want to discuss about geopolitics, follow Claudio. Well, uh, yeah. Maybe we should find out how many people are going to each one, so the ah, smallest group okay. leaves the room. Okay. Otherwise, it's so. How how do we just ask how many we, people want to? Perhaps uh, Claudio may stand up, and those who wanted to follow geopolitics stand up, and then we go with Mike, and then we go with okay. Katarina, and so we see what is more or less the proportion. So geopolitics. Stakes are high. <laughs> Okay, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like 15. 
Thank you. Uh, let's go with Mike. Machine learning and everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit smaller. Okay, good. Okay, and then we have Katarina, AI for diplomacy. Tools. Tools. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> so. So Not and the cafe with a cafeteria, yeah. but there's a little bar just out that way. Okay, to to the lead persons, please come back at 52, please. 52 is the hour to come back.
I'm so sorry. <laughs>
And then, as um, Adam has mentioned, that um, it ha is going to be open for a lot of possibilities in diplomatic writings. And um, another one is um, AI in preparation of negotiation, how um, using trade agreement and rule of region as a um, example and how it takes a long time to go through all the process. So using AI will cut down the time and research by training the machine learning to adapt to a natural language. So those are the three tools that we look at. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, another point that was discussed during the uh, consultations was the disarmament question. Um, the use of uh, artificial intelligence in the development of non-lethal weapons um, poses ethical uh, questions, and there is a reluctance on how to regulate that because there are interests um, from the private sector and probably from countries in this regard. Um, there was also a discussion about um, when writing a speech, what to take into consideration in the output. Maybe gather the information first about the audience, then build in um, the information based on the mechanism of fact-checking of what we are going to deliver and also taking into consideration the sentiment um, analysis or adopting a sentiment, uh, sentiment analysis approach to tar target the, the audience correctly. Um, other questions coming from India uh, on how to use the artificial intelligence tools uh, in the um, public, public policy making. Um, another question or another point was about um, the chatbots for uh, counselor services. And the last, last point, will this make people happy using artificial intelligence tools? That's a question open. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, this was really efficient and uh, at least for myself, I'm looking forward to benefiting from robotized or automatized uh, speech writing. That would be very practical. Uh, um, I think that perhaps uh, Mike in about three minutes, you or any of your rapporteurs could uh, summarize your discussions. Yeah, I'm just going to talk for 10 seconds to say <laughs> when I introduced our topic, I laid out nine possible topics and predicted we would have the 10th, 11th, and 12th, and indeed we did. Um, and I'll turn it over to our, to our summaries. Uh, so we, we mostly tried to focus on machine learning and big data, and we mostly tried to focus on how government can do the right thing or the wrong thing, uh, both by themselves and in encouraging the private sector to do the right things. But anyway, we had two people who didn't move fast enough and got volunteered. <laughs> So one of the points that came out was uh, transparency, uh, especially in the government, uh, to have government leading by example um, and to establish uh, trust with the, the population. Uh, and that goes through education as well, so to show how the pub uh, to the public how the algorithm is made and uh, to raise awareness around the digital literacy. Um, we also talked about um, responsibility. Um, if AI are managing, who will hold? Uh, who will be held responsible? And the role of uh, courts uh, in that case. Um, and I don't know if my. Would you like to? Um, so among many other things, uh, we have set a consensus on uh, the fact that machine learning systems can be used or seen or perceived <laughs> as an opportunity to detect existing biases and therefore then uh, after we have used machine learning systems to identify problems, um, talk together among, among uh, diverse stakeholders to find solutions.
any particular examples of successes? Because we, we, we did have some nice examples, both of successes and failures. Do you want to talk to that? No? Just uh, on, the, on the successes, we, we have seen machine learning used quite effectively in cybersecurity and in some policing activities. But on the failures, we had a number of examples in school admissions, in uh, monitoring infrastructure, uh, and, and trying to make sure that everybody has good roads. I mean, there's, there's a lot of places where if you don't get a full data set, you end up with a biased uh, conclusion. So that was, that was one of the recurring themes. But thank you very much for, uh, for that, and uh, I hope we kept within our three minutes. Great, you did great. Thank you so much, Mike, and that sounds very interesting. And I think that, Claudio, are you ready? Have you, do you have your mic? No, not at all, but my <laughs> rapporteurs are <laughs> okay. from the team. That's great. Uh, the thing is, I, I think we, we ended up with an exercise that was the, the, the closer to a future exercise, what we imagine, because we're looking at strategies as, as they are now, but we do not have a way to see how they're developing in this very particular area for the future. So the idea was to look at, at which, which characteristics or which issues governments consider relevant in the strategy that they're devising now, and then possible possible alternatives for to, to build uh, uh, and to, to consolidate or to improve the geopolitical uh, position over the future. So, Yelena, would you like to start? Yes, so we had a few inputs from a few countries, but uh, the strategic issues they face, but um, I am right now. So we had inputs from Australia, the Netherlands, and India. Um, what uh, came out of the discussion is that there is uh, not a lot of regulation about IA except from uh, initiatives uh, in the EU. And we wonder if uh, the fact that um, the European Union would like to have some regulation on artificial intelligence would uh, just scare off some investors. There's a paradox over there. Uh, moreover, we talked about digital capacities and the fact that some countries could be doomed um, to stay out of the system if they don't have access to data. The countries need to ask themselves um, if they actually want to keep the balance or is artificial intelligence um, a way to change the current balance, I think. I don't know if it's accurate. It is accurate, Jorge, if you allow me just one second more, because uh, concerning the access to data thing, a very interesting proposition came from our friends from, from Amsterdam and from um, Fresa from uh, United States about uh, ways to access this data and cooperation. I think this, is, this could be food for thought. If you could elaborate a minute or two on that. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, what we're working on is, uh, well, like a, a protocol or, or uh, uh, a practical platform for companies to exchange uh, data. Like, for example, we have a, a exchange, we, um, we have a stock exchange, right? Uh, but we don't have a data exchange yet. While though, you know, there's a strong interest for anyone, for any country, for any company to exchange more data. So one example I gave is flight data. For example, uh, KLM, their airplanes, you know, they generate black, they have a black box, they generate data for security purposes, for efficiency purposes, but they just analyze their own data. So if you could aggregate this data to make more big data, that would benefit, any, you know, any involved company. So you could do that across any sector, but you need some kind of protocol, some kind of platform, very practical to, uh, to exchange uh, data. And that's what we're working on. Have you yeah. written something up on this, or can we yeah, find it? Yeah, definitely, yeah. We call it now, we call it the Amsterdam Data Exchange. Thank um, you. Yeah, so if you want to know more about that, then just get in touch with me. Okay, perfect. Then we, we have the three reports uh, from the breakout th uh, groups, and uh, we still have 24 minutes to discuss. So um, the floor is open, really. Uh, Anyone wants to break the ice, uh, wants to react to something uh, which has been explained now or something that uh, 
still is lingering from the breakout uh, group, so something that has not been discussed yet, but which uh, is related to the three main topics uh, we were handling, and I see Mike, uh, who is eager to take the mic. Not because I want to say anything, it's because I want to ask something. Okay. How many people here are working for a government or with an intergovernmental organization? Okay. So I've been to a lot of UN meetings and ITU meetings this year, and I keep hearing governments say, we're really concerned about artificial intelligence. We've got to do something. Have any of you figured out what you need to do? This is a serious question. I mean, what, what tool do you have to control machine learning and artificial intelligence? I would say first we start defining what artificial intelligence is, what comes out of artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence is a field, and what comes out of it are the tools. And when it comes to the tools, we have machine translation, speech recognition, autonomous weapons, and so on. So the, there is a confusion generally when we present artificial intelligence, and it is probably overhyped during the last few years. Everybody is giving it more importance than it deserves, and no one can explain it, and it looks just the uh, like a ghost, or a, but it needs to be defined first. That was, a, that was actually the most important low-hanging fruit that our group identified. The second one was R&D. Clearly, companies, countries are pouring a lot of money into this area. Are there other tools, other levers that governments have here? Well, I fundamentally disagree with my colleague because I think we need to pay attention to artificial intelligence. And in the working group, we were discussing about, you know, developing a much more constructive, robust criteria to distinguish between several applications of artificial intelligence. And I must say that specifically in the field of lethal autonomous weapons, for instance, we have international humanitarian law that may apply broadly to the uh, design, deployment, and use of lethal autonomous weapons. But there are many other uh, potential applications. Some of them are beneficial. Some of them we don't know yet. But uh, you know, at the rapid pace at which technologies are evolving and transforming our lives, I would say that we do need to pay uh, serious attention to what's going on. Thank you. Another lever that we talked about was procurement. Obviously, governments can make sure they're buying AI tools that are used in a transparent way so you can see if there's discrimination. So that was another lever that we, we found. Back here. Uh, I'd say that given that every country has identified workforce as an issue, that's certainly a lever that every country has to make investments in their workforce, uh, to make R&D investments, to make uh, education investments. If it's really going to be transform, if you expect it to be transformative, yeah. Uh, building off of that, I think uh, be, we talked about one thing in our group: uh, government being a role model and uh, leading by example in terms of their own transparency. Of this was an algorithmic decision that we made on your behalf as the government, and if the government can lead in that way, uh, then consumers will uh, in turn demand and expect the same from private sector. Thank you very much. Um, oh. I just maybe want to identify not something that our government is actually doing, but a problem that we are struggling with, and it is that we don't have, as a government, resources to hire um, the, well, the best experts in the field so as to actually come up with solutions. I don't know if that's a general issue with governments or not. But that's definitely something that we're struggling with. To give an example, but actually in the field of cybercrime, our uh, federal cybercrime unit is now down to the last two uh, people because all the rest is working for private companies where they get paid a lot more. Yeah, well, that, that's definitely also a problem we see in, in Switzerland, for instance. I saw here a colleague. 
you want to chime in? Hi. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Maria Mourani. I represent uh, the government of Quebec in Canada. Uh, we, uh, in the issue of uh, intelligence uh, artificial, uh, in uh, December, we're going to launch uh, an observatory of uh, social impact, and uh, we, uh, we, we give money to different organizations who work in uh, uh, the ethic of uh, intelligent artificial. For example, we have a group in Montreal. They uh, did the Declaration de Montréal, and they will present it on uh, uh, November 15, I guess. So we, we, we are very involved in uh, ethic issues, how to use uh, the artificial intelligence in the good way. So we, um, we, in, we give money to different groups who are working in, in these issues, and here in UNESCO, uh, we, uh, we, we are involved in the different activities and different uh, you know, steps to maybe we're going to see if we can have something, uh, you know, maybe a declaration or something like this in uh, ethics. I guess it's very important, ethics. And when we say in Quebec it's important, it's not just the word. We, uh, we do things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Perhaps two follow-up questions. How do you work uh, with other stakeholder groups uh, beyond government? And uh, how do you interact uh, on the international arena? So are you following these issues here in, in uh, the IGF, but also in other fora, I guess? So how, how do you tackle that? We are here, first of all, in UNESCO. So uh, we involve in different uh, activities and discussions. And uh, in Quebec, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we help different stakeholders or the expert too. We have expert, Quebecers expert here too. So uh, it's how the government can be involved. But we have to, ne uh, we, we need uh, uh, an international guideline you know, like a convention. Uh, so we see, we, we have to, uh, to, to, to be all together to decide something. It's not only Quebec. So we, we observe, and in our, you know, in our territory, we, uh, we're working with different groups, different experts, to think about ethic, think about laws, so I guess we are in the beginning of this uh, bra big brain, you know. So we are with all the world. We are not alone in these uh, issues. And uh, it's important to know when, when you, you say uh, government, the government said, OK, we, we like ethics, we want ethics, and we do things for that. It's not just a word for us. I don't know for the others. I think Katerina wanted to react on this. Not? not directly, but this general question of uh, what governments are we actually talking about? What countries are we talking about? And in our group discussion, one important question that came up was the question of the digital divide when we talk about AI applications as tools for diplomats or generally being used, what about uh, developing countries? What about small states? We're talking about a lot of investment here that some countries can afford, also a lot of thinking that goes into that that some countries can afford, while others can't. So there's a question of the digital divide. And then from, for example, our perspective as Diplo Foundation, there's an also a question of capacity development. We talk about uh, developing AI tools, AI applications. Are they being shared? How are they being shared? Can we think of mechanisms um, to, to do that? So I think one very important thing to, I guess, keep reminding ourselves in this room is 
what governments are we talking about, what countries are we talking about, and are we keeping in mind those that might not have the same opportunities to start investing in AI and start experimenting in these areas? So, any reaction on, on that? Because, uh, at least as, as far as I'm, uh, I'm aware, there are some uh, uh, strategies of some countries from, uh, uh, let's say, emerging economies who are taking a lead on this because they see this as a, an opportunity to leapfrog also in, in terms of development. Uh, how do you see this question? Or um, if there are no reactions on this, uh, do you agree with the idea put forward that we need uh, an international convention on artificial intelligence? And what artificial intel uh, what kind of convention? Who would be drafting that? Who would be discussing that? So, uh, is there any reaction? Please. I think it's too early on to, you know, look at the contours, how this ecosystem is evolving. I think we are looking, uh, in fact, in our small group, we came up some, with some great ideas of how it can be used. But I think over the next year or so, we should be able to get some clearer thoughts on where it is and then probably look at doing that. It's premature, I mean, in my view at this time, unless we want to set up a vision, you know, what we want to do. Any any other opinions on this? Please. And then. Yeah, I'm Lane Rompanen. I'm actually from an NGO, Electronic Frontier Finland. So uh, from the NGO side, there was this year the uh, Toronto Declaration, protecting the rights to equality and non-discrimination in machine learning systems. I, I agree with the previous speaker that it's probably, it's, we don't really have a comprehensive understanding about the AI or intelligence systems or machine learning or how it's going to change the world or things, the way we do things. In general, I would say that it's important that when we start using various AI systems or intelligence systems or machine learning, we need to be doing it very reiterating again and again and really understanding what's going on instead of just trusting that, okay, now this, this is going well. There, are, there will be unex unintended consequences. There will be biases that we don't realize are there et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be a very much an educational process, a learning process, or as we say it in Finnish, Siberia educates. <laughs> yeah, that's a good opinion. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would like to react about the uh, argument that supposedly we should be fully aware of uh, what artificial intelligence is bec before uh, trying to put some limits on it. I think it would be too late when we realize what it really is. We may not have the option to really do something about it. So I think we are already aware of some principles that should be uh, upheld in front of this trend. So um, although we do not fully know what artificial intelligence is going to become in the future, we should reaffirm some principles that should stand on the way of uh, certain evolutions of, artif of um, artificial intelligence in the future. What principles? Um, well, I, I am honored to have the responsibility to uh, give a list of them, <laughs> but uh, for instance, the fact that um, a decision uh, of life or death shouldn't be uh, given uh, or entrusted to machine. Uh, the fact that uh, there should be always a way to uh, retake the control of uh, some process that is uh, given or entrusted to a machine, that it's not something uh, just one way around, uh, one way uh, street, that we should be able to get back control when necessary. Um, to be aware that, machine, that, that a machine is being used in order to make a decision. So those are like three principles that come to my mind right now. Oh, that's a very pretty substantive list uh, of uh, at least very basic principles. So I think uh, our Finnish colleague wants to chime in again. 
Yeah, so I mean, there is already a boatload of various items of international law, international conventions. So maybe it's more about how to apply those to AI or machine learning. I mean, if we manage to make a world where more more nations, more cities, more the international convention of human rights would be followed better, it would be a much better world already. So I don't think we need so much new stuff, but to apply the existing stuff more and better. Thank you so much. Um, I see some colleagues are leaving the room already because we are nearing the, the end of, the, of this session. So I, I would ask uh, all of you, uh, and especially also the, the leads, uh, what do you see as the, f the possible follow-up for this? Um, how do we avoid that we come back in one year in Berlin and we uh, rediscuss the same thing again from uh, scratch. So how, how do you see uh, this uh, uh, getting forward in, in the next uh, 12 months? How do we make a difference uh, with uh, the, the rich engagement we had in this room and uh, also in, in other sessions uh, about artificial intelligence which are happening uh, during these three days? So. Anyone wants Can to I take I'm the lead? Moder I'm moderating another session in nine minutes. I would like to, to uh, first thing, because I, when Mike made the second call, I realized that our group, in, in spite of the fact that we were dealing with, the, with, the, uh, with how states view AI and how they view it in, as a tool to perform in an international scenario, our group was not left with, with many of the people who raised their hands here as working for governments or in diplomatic services. So, and so this is maybe one takeaway. I think if, if governments came in a year and had a, 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 a clearer view of which are the issues that they consider could be impacted to them as a state's institutions concerning the application of, of, of I, I don't like to use the expression AI again, I was looking for machine learning or analytics over big data. How does this automating decision uh, process matters to them as a states. And then one second takeaway from the rich discussion that we have is maybe sketch co cooperation mechanisms as the ones that, that, that was brought here by our, our, our friend from Amsterdam. This is the, an idea of a cooperation mechanism that would help enhance these international relations could be a good takeaway for the next, for the next year. Thank you very much. And I apologize for having to leave for the, for the next session. Well, anyway, thank you very much for, for these uh, substantive ideas. Um, I think Mike wanted to get uh, to the floor. Uh, just uh, a big thank you to all the people who broke out in our session and uh, an even bigger thank you to those of you from government who chimed in. When, when I was in government, it was always safer not to open my mouth. Um, I think next steps are up to each of us to go back and take some of the things we've learned here, and particularly some of the references, some of the examples, and, and share those. Uh, in our group, I mentioned that I've heard over and over again, Stephen Hawking thinks artificial intelligence is going to kill the planet. We must do something. Much better to really think about each of the different technologies that make up artificial intelligence have a reasoned discussion about it, and understand what can and cannot be done. To that end, tomorrow you can go to a best practices forum session on Internet of Things, Big Data, and Artificial Intelligence. We have a report that's on the IGF website. You can engage in that discussion, point us to more sources of good information, point us to more examples. That's very draft, it's a very early draft, so it's not too late to have a huge impact on a paper that I think is going to be read by a lot of people. It's being read right now in Dubai, where the ITU is trying to figure out what to do about artificial intelligence. That's a very reasonable, sensible proposal to look into that best practices forums paper 
which I, I glanced over and I, I saw very many interesting and useful information also for our work, for instance, in the Council of Europe and uh, the OECD. So uh, I think that surely Katarina wants to still give us uh, some final remarks uh, from her side. <laughs> uh, very quickly, because time's advancing. I have, I have two points to conclude. One is we need to very seriously think about meaningful human control and not just in the area of lethal autonomous weapons, but also in the area of various AI applications. How much control are we comfortable relinquishing? How much decision making, but also cognitive, uh, how to say, cognitive ability do we want to retain? What kind of analysis are we happy to outsource? What kind of analysis should come from us? So how are we comfortable in that? And the other point, also going back to the question of um, what about next year? Are we going ha to have the, exactly the same kind of conversation? And to answer that, I would encourage uh, more experimentation. So we're seeing lots of small-scale projects, lots of pilot projects, and I think there needs to be more of that, more exploration, more learning by trial and error when it comes to tools, for example, for diplomacy and policy making, and to discuss that and to learn from that. I think that's the only option we have uh, going forward. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think that uh, we have three minutes left, uh, but uh, if uh, we are done with the discussion, we can give you back two minutes of your life now, uh, unless there is any final burning comment you want to make. And otherwise, I suggest uh, and I urge you to follow up with this good work, with these good discussions and that you also profit from the summary of this session that will be surely be made by the Geneva Internet Platform. And with this, I would uh, really uh, like to sincerely thank you for your engagement or, and for being here uh, this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>